landed on planet 412. I'll be your captain of sorts as we navigate this strange cryptid filled world. Join me on the quest for truth through the strange, mysterious, and supernatural. This is Planet 412. And welcome to Planet 412, everybody. I am your host, Matt M. It is a special Thursday edition, and we have one of my very good friends here tonight. We have Christopher Garitano. I call him the producer because he is a TV producer. Uh, he's doing a lot of amazing things, and we will be speaking with him shortly. I just wanted to say hello to everybody real quick uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. Um, you know, the things that Christopher are, is doing are the types of things that a lot of us dream of when we're kids. You know, we watch TV, we see those actors on TV, or maybe we look at it through different eyes. We look at through, you know, those camera eyes of, I want to be the one someday to be making these TV shows, to be making these movies. And a lot like some of the other people that maybe decide they wanted to be an astronaut and it doesn't quite go that way. That's the way that it goes for others with maybe directing TV shows or movies. Well, Chris Garitano is doing those things now. He is achieving great things and great dreams. And, you know, he is doing amazing things here. And, you know, I, I just wanted to say something uh, aside from him being a good friend of mine, he's also given me just priceless information and, and advice, and I really appreciate that of him. So without further ado, we're going to bring Chris in, and Christopher, welcome for being on Planet 412. We appreciate it. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. Good to be here. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. And, you know, like I had said to everybody, you know, this is a special Thursday edition and I appreciate you making the time for the, to being here tonight. Um, I, I wanted to let everybody know I wanted to read your bio real quick. So okay. um, Chris is a graduate of the School of Visual Arts with a degree in film. Christopher is the creator and director of the award winning docu docudrama Montauk Chronicles from 2015. He is the co-creator, co-director, executive producer, and co-host of the History Channel's The Dark Files 2017. In 2019, Christopher created, executive produced, directed, and hosted his eight-episode investigative series, Strange World, which is absolutely phenomenal, by the way. Thanks. For the Travel Discovery Channel Network, Christopher is the host and creator-producer of the ongoing weekly podcast, Off to the Witch. He's also preparing to release the first feature-length chapter, A Haunting We Will Go, of his new TV docuseries. He is also the writer-creator South Texas Blues, originally published in Fangoria Magazine, comic and book. Christopher is currently writing and is developing his first feature-length horror movie, Bury me in a nameless grave. Wow. I mean, I, I, I'm speechless. And everything that you have put out so far, you know, I have seen. I have watched all of your episodes. And I know a lot of the people that are here right now uh, uh, have seen much of them. And it's just and it's an honor to have you here, Chris. Oh, thank you. Likewise. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you right off the uh, off of the go here. We talked a little bit in the green room. You had popped up, you know, a, a, a book that you wanted to bring up uh, when we started talking. Because the first thing I definitely wanted to do was speak to you about was, you know, when did you start getting that itch? When did it, you know, bite you? So I, I'll I, let you take it. Yeah, I think from birth, because my parents love this stuff. And my, I don't have it. Do I have it close by? It's probably in the other room, but my mom had a book when she was a little kid and it was Alfred Hitchcock's ghostly gallery and her name with her maiden name is still in there and making uh, this new donkey series, the first feature length movie is called a haunting. We will go. And it's not, it does have a lot of 
direct locations that are haunted. It has people that are interested in exploring that, but it's not your typical ghost episode. So to answer your question, it really, I, I would say the first quarter of the movie is that nostalgia. It's that it's those very things that inspired me. And it was a combination of things. Cause if you recall, when you're a little kid, there's so much happening at once in those formative years, you're absorbing movies, cartoons, everything from decades past, um, music, uh, literature, books, you know, I, I went to book fairs constantly. So my interest in the paranormal was strong. And I, I didn't, we didn't call it the paranormal back then, but like, um, there were a variety of, of labels for these things, you know, real monsters, mysteries, um, ghost stories. And I have two of the books here that were the, were the things that I carried around with me constantly. And I don't know if any of your um, viewers will remember either one of these, but I remember this one, and who knows how quickly it went out of print. This, is, this one was, uh, I picked this up at a book fair. And just, you know, as a little kid, I think maybe four or five years old, five years old, looking through these, this was my first exposure. But it was alongside other ghost stories and um, other paranormal mysteries at the time that were either on Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of, the television show, or uh, yeah, I'm just looking for a particular page. Uh, but I mean, this, this, just seeing these images, you know, they weren't watered down. And each of these paintings had a whole history about them. They were illustrated. I mean, you could feel the story looking at each of these and just fascinated by the idea that there are real people claiming that these supernatural things that I, that we were exposed to in, in movies in, that are supposed to be fiction are actually real. And um, this was the other one. This is the one I could not put down. And this had a, a Tolkien illustrator who did Lord of the Rings at that time. And we're talking late seventies, early eighties, but let me get to um, one that really stood out for me. And that I later read other people were influenced by, and there's everything in these books. It's a variety. It's not just one paranormal topic, but I mean like, you know, it, the, these weren't, these are like stories of witchcraft and um, stories of, um, exorcisms and hold on i'm looking for the werewolf psychic abilities esp you know the, that whole world just blew me away um i'm just looking for this because linda godfrey later wrote a a, a book what was it american werewolves mm -hmm. okay. i believe she, that was the title she was incredible sure so it really hit me in that book when she described an illustration in this book that I carried around when I was a kid, it just blew me away. And she said that that illustration well represented essentially the werewolf that um, people were claiming to have seen. I mean, there's everything. Here it is. Okay. And then this is one shot of it. I'll show two. So, yeah, it was this kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. And then this was a spell that somebody would conjure up and turn themselves into a werewolf, you know, kind of selling their soul to, uh, to the powers of hell. I mean, it's all folklore, yeah. but, right. but it's that kind of thing that really inspired me. And then, you know, I saw films like American Werewolf in London, the Amityville Horror. Oh. Um, all of these things hit me at once. And I only lived 15 minutes from the actual Amityville house. So that was a very real situation growing up with. And it was confusing because your parents are telling you, you know, this isn't real. It's just in the movies. Yet you're reading real accounts and on in search of you're seeing interviews with people who claim they, they truly experience these things. Mm -hmm. Amityville, the book by Jay Anson, on the cover it said, based on a true story. So your parents are trying to basically uh, wish the shadows away before you go to bed so you don't have nightmares. But my mother, um, you know, there was a family tragedy. Uh, my mother's cousin was killed very young in a, a horrible car accident when I was a kid. Right. And this is where things changed for me because one um, evening, 
you know, my mother was in shock because she told us this story that earlier that afternoon, and it was winter time, that she had tried on one of Cindy's sweaters, I think it was, and the room got very cold, the door shut, and she felt a presence in the room. And so from then on, there was no convincing me that the stuff I was reading in my books uh, or, or movies like the Amityville Horror or Poltergeist was unreal, was fiction, yeah. was only fiction. You know, and that's where it all started for me at that moment. That's phenomenal. And, you know, you and I are, are you know, of the same generations. You know, we're not very far apart in age. Um, do you mind saying how old you are, Chris? Yeah, I'll be uh, 48 in July. I, and I'm I'm 50. So I'm two years older than you. And, uh, you know, my birthday is May 21st. And we grew up during that that. Absolutely, in my opinion, the greatest time in movies and horror. That genre was just incredible. And just to, real quick for uh, for Linda Godfrey's book, "Hunting the American Werewolf" was was the book. I just wanted to, to Hunting correct. Hunting the it. American Werewolf. Are you, how many books did she write? Because I haven't. She wrote a, a bunch. So I'm this. I this is the one that I pulled up. Maybe it was. That's not the one. Yeah. Okay. So then I I do swear I remember Chris that that there was called the the American Werewolf as well. Um, if anybody in the in the uh, chat could you know let us know if that's exactly you know which what her first one was. But you know we've spoken before about that '80s stretch there of how those those directors and those movies really made such a gigantic impact on sure. so many people that now like yourself you know are producing things and making uh, you know even youtubers it, it, it's you know had effects on them as well um you know what are some of the movies that really grabbed you growing up that had a big effect on you we'll be here all night um <laughs> well you know and, and and i described that period as the pinnacle of of imagination you know and it, and i was absorbing it all at once so I, from a young age, watched everything my parents saw, probably my grandparents, because I was absorbed by universal monsters, monster movies, mm -hmm. creature features of the 70s and early 80s, um, everything from Savage Harvest, I don't know if you remember that, to Alligator. Um, oh, yeah. Phase four, uh, you know, with the ants, very intelligent ants. It was a movie by Saul Bass. Uh, only movie he ever really directed. And um, then going forward, of course, there was this explosion of, you know, these tentpole monster movies like Predator, Aliens, uh, Ridley Scott's Alien before that, Jaws, of course. Um, and then horror films, uh, you know, everything from slasher films to really profound horror films like The Exorcist. Um, so all of these movies were hitting me at once. And these were master, masters of composition, cinematography, lighting, storytelling, as opposed to, I think a lot of people are, have lost that. Not everyone, there's some great storytellers now in that medium, but um, those motion pictures uh, are the reason why uh, I, I'm doing what I'm doing and have been doing since I was that age. I mean, I was making backyard movies by the time I was eight, so. I haven't stopped since then. There was never a pause. There was never a, a sidetrack. I don't know what in God's name a side hustle is, but I don't do stuff like that. I have one thing that is, you know, and it has many branches, but this is what I do. You know, this right. is life. This is my life. Now, obviously we'll, we'll talk about the professional side of everything that you're doing. And, you know, everybody, some of you have seen this shirt before. I had this made of, you know, when Chris interviewed me on, on Off to the Witch, and uh, this was, uh, I believe it was episode 69, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, I think so, yeah. yeah. I'm sure it is, but this is one of my, my wife's favorite uh, thumbnails that, any, in fact, I think it's her favorite. She's uh, in here, Twirl Pros in the chat. Does it reminds her as well of, of Stranger Things, and she loves it. But I, I'm just I the director of that image. I'm not the artist, you know. Well, it's still from your show, 
uh, and one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. Uh, so I just wanted to wear that. But going back to when you're younger, you know, I know that you've had some strange things happen to yourself through your lifetime. Can you let us know, like, you know, when was the first something that happened to you when you knew for sure, uh, other than what happened to your mother, you know, uh, that there was other things out there other than what was on TV? Well, I, I guess maybe some things happened when I was a little kid, but looking back in hindsight, you know, I don't know if it was just because I had such a, you know, head full of all of these things, like in these books that I showed you, or a mm -hmm. movie like the Amityville Horror is basically letting you know your home is not safe, that there are in forces unseen. But the, the one time that I had full confirmation was when I was about 14. It was in October. It was around Halloween. I remember that. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it had anything to do with it, but I do remember it was in the fall. And I was staying at a friend's house. And, um, you know, we were listening to heavy metal and, uh, you know, uh, watching horror films. And, you know, this is something I did every day. So I've never had this experience before and only one time after on the next night. And what happened was I was um, sleeping on my buddy's floor. And there were, I think there were maybe three of us in the room all together. He was on his bed and two of us were sleeping in, you know, sleeping bags or blankets on the floor. And um, I'm laying there and I'm as I'm falling asleep, I'm looking up at because he had this ceiling full of uh, glow in the dark green stars. And, and I remember just kind of laying there and I believe we were listening to music for a little while. And when that tape ran out or the CD stopped or whatever we were listening to, um, I was asleep and then I was awakened by this loud whispering. I woke up from it. You know, I was in a deep sleep and then I woke up and I heard this whispering and it was constant. It was certainly being articulated by someone, I, you know, a female, it sounded like a female voice articulating a whispering, but I couldn't make out what it was saying. Uh, I couldn't make out the words, but it was in the cadence of sentences. Mm -hmm. It's like a conversation of one. And I came out of my sleep and it was dark in the room. So I'm looking around the room and I, I said, hey, who's doing that? And I, I knew instinctively at that moment that this was something strange. I felt it. I was scared when I was listening to it and even in the beginning. And um, so eventually, you know, my buddy had said, go back to sleep. I don't hear anything. So I got up and I walked into his hallway. And then um, I was walking around the house. And because I was compelled to do so, I wanted to find out where this was coming from so i thought maybe because he lived with his sister and his mother and i thought maybe maybe his sister was on the phone i was trying to rationalize it you know at 14 and it wasn't like you know we didn't have back then we didn't have what we have today which is a constant barrage of uh resources of ghost hunters okay it wasn't like that at all back then and it was kind of a unique interest even then i mean there were ideas of that and there were portrayals of that in movies here and there, um, like The Entity and uh, Poltergeist, right? But it wasn't so popular, in other words, at all. It, we didn't have these resources where there were a million ghost hunts going on every night. Right. In my mind, no matter how many horror films I had watched by 14, and trust me, I was immersed in them, uh, it couldn't prepare me for the feeling that I had. And I'm sure you and any of your listeners that have experienced something know the difference that the difference from when a movie scares you and when you know something in your reality is off. So I just wanted to, I was like, what is this? And I'm walking around the house and I'm trying to disprove to myself, maybe you know, anything, the coffee maker went off, something, there's a radio on somewhere that I just can't make out what it's saying. But I knew in my heart and, and in my mind that whatever this was, was emanating 
just as loud in every room. It was like this thing was next to me, whatever this was. So I was scared and I walked back to his room and I laid down and didn't know what to do. And I just sat there listening to it and waiting. And I think eventually I just fell asleep after a while of listening to it because it kept going. And um, woke up the next morning, didn't hear it, of course, and went on with my day. The next night, uh, it was time to go to sleep. I was at my parents' house in my bedroom, and I heard it again. I woke up to it again. At, it was around 3 a.m., and same thing. I, I was still scared, but I wasn't as determined to figure it out at that point. And I'm like, am I going to hear this every night now? And um, just kind of wishing it away, as I recall, this is a long time ago. Um, and then eventually I fell asleep. It, it still didn't stop. Same thing. And it could have been a language I didn't recognize. Like if someone's speaking Russian right now, I'll be able to tell you it's Russian. I don't speak Russian. And if mm -hmm. someone is speaking Spanish, I can tell you it's Spanish. Uh, so it's I can decipher languages. Maybe at that time I wasn't as familiar with the dialect. It sounded like gibberish, though, but it was in the case of a sentence. And then um, woke up the next morning. I've, I never heard it again after that. And that I, without a doubt, that was something otherworldly and, you know, something that I can't explain. You know, it, it's ironic that you brought up that this happened to you at 14. I had just recently been speaking with Josh Turner about when I had my experience with the dog man when I was 14, mm -hmm. Josh had his experience, I believe he was either 14 or 15, when he and his cousins saw one. And now you're telling that you had something happening at 14. It's starting, we're starting to get a like, and I believe there was someone else that had spoken on his show that had an experience, again, at 14. Right. There's something... I wonder if I'd love to know the bigger, grander picture, if there's something along the lines of why that age is maybe the, the brain is developing at a certain point. And, and, you know, I don't know, but I find it odd that that happened to you at 14. Years so there, ago. there is something to that. So a, a very real parapsychologist, Dr. Barry Taff, who used to be one of the three main parapsychologists at the parapsych psychology unit in the early 70s at UCLA. Uh, it was Barry Taff, Kerry Gaynor, and Dr. Thelma Moss was spearheading the operation at the time. This is when a university took parapsychology and the paranormal seriously. Their main investigation was uh, the entity case. But Barry had investigated hundreds of cases after that. And one of the consistent things that he found in a place with poltergeist activity or, or extreme activity was a 12 to 14 year old child. So what in combination with that, and again, this is where science comes in, I guess if we could take 25 of the most infamous cases, whether it be a demonic haunting, poltergeist activity, seeing apparitions, seeing a monster, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. like you did, and if we if we analyze, okay, geographically, what was happening at the time, what what kind of soil is underneath? Was there a large quartz base? Um, is there a geomagnetic pull in that area that's stronger? Um, how old were the people that were experiencing it? And if there were other people experiencing it, were there, were there any children? present. And you can go on and on through this and then compare and contrast. And if there's something consistent across the board, I would say, now let's replicate that. Let's get all of those elements into one place and see if we can see something or manifest something. And then we can get proof, essentially. That and is the experiment. That's incredible. I, I, I didn't know that. that, that I'm, of course, you would know you've been involved in so many things that delve into the psychology and parapsychology and, and the brain. Um, I definitely wanted to 
you know, ask you as we went on about, you know, some of the deeper types of studies that you've gone into. Um, is there anything else, though, that occurred when you got a little older uh, in yeah. terms of paranormal? Yeah, I lived most of my life in, in New York. And there were there, there are a lot of things, I think, looking back in hindsight, like I said, um, you know, I had a period, a dark period where I think I, I picked up some manuals of witchcraft and things like that. And it was a dark period for me as a kid. You know, I, um, you know, I dove into that stuff for a moment. And, but, but another profound thing that I saw, you know, with, that I experienced with five senses uh, was, or perhaps a sixth sense, maybe that's why I saw it, was when I was living in Michigan. Um, my apartment was on the fourth floor of a building in St. Joseph, Michigan. I moved from um, New York to Michigan when I was about 40, I think, or like 39 or 40. And then um, I lived in Michigan for two years at this location. It was right on the lake. And um, I was happy when I moved in, but slowly, uh, my girlfriend and I at the time were, were experiencing things each of us. And one night, you know, I kept feeling this heavy presence when I was sleeping. I would wake up and have uh, the, sensa the sensation of falling into my bed, which has happened to a lot of us, but this was so much. And to such an extreme, I had never experienced that before. And I remember one night I was like, there's something in here. There's something in this house. And, uh, you know, it compelled me to like, do anything I could to clear out energetically the house. And I'm not saying I don't believe in those things. I do. I think certain rituals or prayer or they work if you have faith in them, um, if you believe in them, just like a curse can work if you believe in it, you know. And so I was desperate to try anything because I was not feeling good in that place. And I kept getting injured. I hurt my back just, I think, bending over to pick up my shoes. Just ridiculous things were happening and they weren't very good. And um, so one night, uh, my girlfriend at the time was sleeping in the bedroom and I was on the phone in the living room. And between the bedroom and the living room was a long hallway. It was dark in the hallway. It was dark at the very end where the bedroom was, but I know the door was closed. And to the right, if you were facing me, is my office. And I'm in the living room and I'm on the phone. Now, right now, out of my periphery, I can see, I have a, a statue of Frankenstein's monster over here and uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. And I have artwork on the wall and stuff like that. I can see it all and I can look at you at the same time and I can still recognize the details in each of those things. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's where my office was, probably about where I can see the creature. And I see someone walk from the darkness of the end of the hallway and then into my bedroom. Now, once again, many years later, I'm like, okay, I had that feeling in my throat and in my chest that my instinct is, is telling me this is not her. It's not my girlfriend. But my my brain is like, okay, that was her. I'm just going to go in there and say, hi, like, what are you doing? And as soon as I got off the phone, I had not taken my eyes off the doorway of the office. As soon as I got off the phone, I walked into the office. And there was a snowstorm outside, by the way. We're on the fourth floor, and there's a concrete parking lot underneath. The window is shut, and there's snow building up on the outside of the window. Okay. Nobody's in the office. And I'm like, okay. And I was a little scared. And then I walked into the bedroom, opened the door. She's wrapped up in her blankets, fast asleep for quite some time. And I, w I woke her up and told her what happened. So I would say less than a month later, um, same thing happened, but the inverse. You know, she didn't really like horror films, so I'm watching a horror film in the bedroom, and she was um, watching television on the couch in the living room, and I think she just fell asleep. She comes into the bedroom and said, did you just shake me and say, come to bed? And I'm like, no. She's like, well, somebody did. <laughs> so I can't explain what that was, but obviously there was a lot of activity. That was right on the lake right on Lake Michigan, 
I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Water, which yeah. is so often, and you know, I'm not telling you anything I know you don't know already. Water being, you know, such a defining factor in hauntings and, and ghosts showing up. I, I, that was the last time anything had ever happened with it. There were other things going on. I don't, uh, bad movie, you it with okay, to put it lightly. I That's apologize for interrupting. Go ahead. You know, many years ago, there was an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that I saw. I think it was Unsolved Mysteries, where a couple, and they were very happy, moved into a house, and things started getting sour. In their relationship now that you could say okay you can't attest this to ghosts or bad energy causing this sometimes people just go south but not so abruptly why why do we walk into a location and then all of a sudden it's it's just a horrible feeling you have to listen to that you have these receptors in you what are you feeling why i think this is all connected and it makes sense that it's connected. So that apartment was one of those places, in my opinion. Um, I uh, I used to install uh, hardwired alarms, um, fire systems, and camera systems. So there was one day, um, my partner at the time, his name was Stan. You know, we worked together every day, and we both felt weird when we walked in this place. And so as I'm going into the basement, because we have to go into the drop ceilings to run wires, we got to run them down the walls behind panels and stuff. And um, I'm like, it just feels weird in here, man. And then I'm looking around and this place was a funeral home. There, wow. is a, there was a mortuary here. There was something here because that equipment and it was all equipped for something like that. Now, I don't know mm -hmm. if, was, I don't know exactly what it was, but I was assuming because it, you know, I've been in funeral homes and I didn't walk in ever having a bad feeling outside of sadness, you know, for why I was there a lot of the time. But um, but at this particular place, it had a heavy feeling for some odd reason. Same with the apartment in Michigan and same with other places I've walked into. It's just almost instantaneous, like, oh, wow. You know, and maybe some of us aren't receptive like that, you know, just like there are... I mean, the internal receptors inside, you know, your psychic receptors, your um, physiology that you're not fully aware of, the, th the thing that you might not fully understand that we haven't truly explored. But I do believe and we have a lot of evidence to support that governments have explored these things because I've mm -hmm. spent time with those people, too, uh, especially making Strange World. I was with a whole bunch of those people. In that were in or in and out of government that have been confirmed 100% that the governments around the world have experimented with these abilities, have experimented with the paranormal, but for us it's reserved as entertainment purposes only, and they'd like to keep it that way. We, we could explore these things, you know, our instinct, or, you know, perhaps it's just the same thing that makes an animal run to a different direction when a storm is coming. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, you brought up the government thing real quick. And since you did, what are your thoughts on, um, and there's people that I'm sure they're going to be asking questions. We'll bring them up. Thank you for answering that. On people projecting, on, on the government really, you know, really putting a lot of money and time and effort into people uh, being able to project themselves to other worlds and, and find certain people on the planet in, in their own minds. What's your thoughts on that? Projecting, you mean um, like remote uh, viewing? Yes, but I'm sorry. Correct. I, I meant remote viewing. Well, um, I spent a little time at the Monroe Institute, and I was with the CIA remote viewer one. I was also with the people who were involved in the men who stare at goats as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I met with those people. I've tried some of their techniques. I went through a remote viewing session. Um, and it's confirmed a hundred percent. Then later spoke to people who are currently working with the, the government. Um, you know, you could trace evidence way back to Marvel comics. What was it in the fifties or early sixties designing X-Men and having the CIA oversee that 
-hmm. It sounds crazy, but it's not. It really happened. And you can, if you do your research, you can find that these things really did happen. And there are books written about it that, that show the evidence and confirm it. This isn't far-fetched stuff. I try to keep myself grounded because there was a time where I was working on the Montauk Chronicles movie and it was a time of research and meeting with each of these people and traveling and you can get you can get sick you know because there's no foundation to your thought process it just goes haywire so keeping that base of science i science doesn't dismiss your your spiritual nature or your belief in where you go after your body discorporates science is a measuring system and we should keep that measuring system in place and it's infinitely more fascinating too. I mean, I love good storytelling just as much, but we have to keep science in place to try and understand what's happened to us. It's our only measuring system, even to understand our own receptors, as I was saying earlier, you know, like mm -hmm. our own alert system. Uh, science is the only thing that's going to help us measure these things and, th and then maybe recreate it and confirm it. So I, I'm a firm believer in those things too. I am too. You know, you could ask my wife again. She's in the chat. She's she's uh, helping out in there. I I am one of those people that use my gut instincts as another word for you know your receptors. Go with your gut. Something that I follow religiously in the majority of my life. Um, I mean, I'm talking in the nine, high 90 percentile. When I trust my gut, my entire life I've been almost correct the entire time so uh your body i agree your body does uh explain those things to you you get those those kind of uh willies if you want to call them when you go in sure. have you ever been in a building when you were doing that other than that one facility where you were just like man i don't want to be in here you know it, have you ever gotten that feeling yeah uh, i had a buddy once we went to a mall and we bought cds we walk out we're kind of looking at the stuff we bought in the car, parked behind the mall, sort of, as I remember. And we're just hanging out, talking about the music and listening to music. And then all of a sudden we both froze and we're like, do you feel like we should move? And he's like, yeah, like right now. And we moved and about 20 seconds later, this big truck just flew right through the place. Oh. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The wow, same that thing that right. you're thinking heavily of someone and then they call you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think these are all clues that there's so much more to us and to our existence. And obviously your audience knows this, but um, sometimes you get really smug people who, as you know, have probably challenged you in every turn. And one of the dumbest things I ever heard was, I can tell you why there are no ghosts. Well, how come no one's ever encountered a Neanderthal ghost? And I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. How do you know what kind of ghost you're encountering? <laughs> exactly. How do you Thank know you. The, the spirits in the entity case weren't Neanderthal ghosts attacking this woman? You know, mm -hmm. like, no, you don't know. That's right. ridiculous. That's a ridiculous argument. There, there are m millions of eyewitnesses throughout human history that have experienced these things. And I, I'd said this in my show recently that in any court of law with millions of eyewitnesses, it would be confirmed. But we haven't been able to confirm this for some reason. Uh, and I want I want to, you know, before we get deeper into some of these other things, have, have was there any other events? Because I want to finish with you and, and the events that, uh, you know, of high strangeness. Has there been anything else that has happened with you as your life has gone to this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if you don't want to, you don't have no, to I'll share this. It was funny. I mean, it was sad, but it was funny. So my grandmother passed away. We were very close very sorry. and she would always ask me, are you going to cry when I die? And I'd say, shut up. I don't, don't talk about you dying. I don't want you to die. So she passed away and I, I was sitting alone crying for a minute. And then I, you know, pulled myself together and that was that. And I swear I heard her say, that's all. <laughs> like, you're not, I'm not getting more than this. <laughs> so, that's yeah, all. I, I heard it. Yeah. 
and I fully believe that, you know, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned to you, you know, and this isn't about me. I just wanted to real quick mention this, you know, uh, some of the health issues I went through, I had a, an artery blow in my leg and I had a near death experience where my heart had stopped for over 90 seconds, uh, at when I had my leg amputated and I saw my dead mother and father. So I really appreciate that, what you just said, because, um, you know, I, obviously I don't want to die. I want to be here as long as possible, but I don't fear death because there's something afterwards and the ones that we love are there. So she definitely was talking to you. I believe that for sure. That's beautiful. Chris, we have a, a, a comment for you here, I believe. From Masochist Mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, I got a nagging feeling to call one of my former neighbors before I couldn't anymore. Year before last, instead of putting it off, called less than a week later, he died. Now, that was okay. I thought that was a question. Yeah. I apologize. Okay. I wasn't. Yeah, I, I had a lot of, man, I had a lot of odd things happen, even in the dreamscape, you know, like I had a friend that, uh, that passed away of a drug overdose and I found him dead. And I was carrying that with me for a long time. And then just one day in a dream, I saw him and he's like, why, why are you, this is not your problem. This is mine. You know, let it go. Cause you just, you're just hurting yourself. And it was him. You know, when you have a dream and sometimes you see things in a dream, it's a dream. You could see people that are alive in your dream. They weren't, it, it feels like a dream. It was silly. It was, it was complicated, you know, but this was him. And there were two incidents in my life where I believe a spirit came to me in a dream. And he, he was one of them and he was telling me to let it go. Would you mind telling us the other? My grandmother. The, was your not, that, not that long ago. Yeah. It, it was beautiful. only months ago. And it's not a frequent thing. No, and, and you know what, I'm glad that you said that word, dreamscape, because um, I've shared recently, just within the last, uh, now, now the first one I've ever had, it was probably about seven, eight months ago, you know, people have asked, have I ever seen the creature that, that attacked us when I was 14 ever again? And, and, and I said, no, but I did, actually, I had. And I've called it exactly that, a dreamscape type dream. And that's the only way I could explain it because it was so real. It was not like any dream where it's vague and you don't remember anything the next day. It was like you and I standing there when I when I said goodbye to you the day I went to the airport in, in Texas. It was like we were standing there talking. I was basically attacked in my own backyard. You know, I always say this to anybody that's not listening. You know, when you, when you have dreams and you in your dream, you're home, but it's not your house. It's, sure. But in your head, it says it's your dream. It was my backyard that I live, that I have right outside this this black uh, uh, shade right here pulled. I, I have the woods back behind our house and we have a fence and I had heard something. I walked back to that fence and I was physically attacked. Right. I was thrown on the ground. I felt the wind get knocked out of me. Uh, and some being was on top of me, ripped my right pant leg off, which is the leg I lost. Wow. Walked something I was starting to come to form was an animal type something. Put my prosthetic in its mouth ripped the prosthetic off of my leg and threw it into the woods, crawled up on top of me and put its head almost touching. You know, when you're with that special someone and you're almost so close that you almost touch, you feel that kind of energy in between. That's how close it was. And that's the first time wow. I have ever seen the creature again that almost killed us. And it mind spoke to me. It had the eyes glowing. It actually dripped saliva in my mouth. I tasted it in my dream. I could smell a, a, a animal, like not bad smell, just like a, a sweaty, like right. farm animal smell. And it spoke to me and it said, I came for you all those years ago. You speak of me too much and I will see you again. And wow. then I woke up 
and I was soaking wet. My puppy was awake. It was 4.30 in the morning. She had her paws on my thighs. Her head, her ears were down. Her tail was between her legs. She was whining. Wow. I mean, that was ultra realistic like you would mention that it was just another level of of reality it, it really was like something spoke to me and you know something else that happened recently where it came through my back window and that was about it but that one right there you know when you said dreamscape that really drew my attention you know you've done a lot of work um you know delving into the mind and how how far you can go do you want to talk a little bit about that well i mean when i was a kid i was fascinated just like the rest of us by um any ability because i was watching movies like firestarter the dead zone um scanners you know mm -hmm. and I, I wanted those abilities and little did i know that this was more than fiction. So later on, when I'm designing Strange World, before I pitched it to uh, Travel Discovery Networks, I, um, and this is after I made the Montauk Chronicles. So they discussed all of that stuff with the gentlemen that I, I worked with were all part of this, or claimed to be part of this deep underground government experiment. Then as I'm in the process of making Montauk Chronicles, I find out that these experiments there are other experiments that are tantamount to Montauk that have been confirmed. And there have been psychic tests and the government, there are the governments around the world were trying to groom psychic warriors, trying to design that or, or enhance to see if they could, right? At the very mm -hmm. least. And um, so as I got further into it and resources came into play, you know, because you have, you know, the Dark Files was an investigation into Montauk where there was a, at least a million dollars in the budget. And that I didn't have that to make Montauk Chronicles. And then Strange World was triple that, I believe. And um, in Strange World, I experimented. This is one of the things. But the idea was to kind of replicate the um, electromagnetic energy and the effect on the temporal lobe of the brain. So... This is called the God Helmet. This was designed um, as, as in addition to many devices by a scientist named Michael Persinger. And um, the idea was, once again, to try and replicate a situation that could induce a human being to either have some kind of psychic experience or to replicate a location, the effect on the person. And mm -hmm. I believe that Persinger's goal was one way or another, another, I can replicate this, I can induce the experience with these devices. But I don't think he doubted the spiritual aspect of it or that we might be actually seeing something from another realm. And I think that's the misconception like, some people think, oh, well, he was just trying to replicate the hallucination someone might have if there's a strong geomagnetic or electromagnetic charge in the environment or in the home that you're in. But I honestly think that Persinger believed that this device, yes, could replicate that charge, but the charge itself wasn't causing hallucinations. It was maybe opening, he didn't rule it out that it was opening up some kind of doorway of perception. Mm -hmm. And so now, I went through these experiments myself. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Right. Yeah, I, I, I used uh, the God Helmet. I, I've tried that. I've tried other experiments. Um, and that would have been ongoing with Strange World. There's some really elaborate stuff we were going to do in uh, season two. But I, um, I'm kind of glad it didn't go forward that way because I would rather, if I'm going to do those things, I want to be in control of every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to, cause some people have been mentioning, you know, LSD, obviously when you get into the discussion of, you know, the mind and opening up different parts of the brain and, and that you, you have to touch on to hallucinogens. What right. is, what is your thoughts on on those types of drugs i mean sure. my my thought on it real quick i'm sorry i apologize it's just that that i believe does open 
those parts of the brain that we can't utilize. Yeah, I mean, it, there was a variety of drugs that were given. LSD was one of them. Scopolamine was another one in the um, Holmesburg prison experiments. And what that does in those cases, that it allowed the brain to be manipulated. It made you more malleable and it allowed suggestion to be put into the mind. Um, if you mean the effects of, let's say, um, DMT, for instance, a lot of people believe you are peering into another realm. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have DMT built in us. The, the DMT that you make and that you ingest is enhancing these things. You know, uh, Patty Chayefsky wrote a book called Altered States, and then that was turned into a movie uh, by Ken Russell. And that was about a scientist experimenting with those type of altering drugs and then going into a deprivation tank and in that story, the scientist, his actually name was Dr. Jessup in the story, uh, he um, was regressing into a Neanderthal, even physically, because he was going on this, this trip through his lineage, through human lineage backwards, and that he kept coming out of the tank with new characteristics. Uh, his, his throat was changing. His body was changing. Physic, so th so the ethereal was manifesting into the physical, and I think there was something to that. Um, as the mind control experiments go, uh, once again, these drugs allowed these people to to, to in, help them be fractured. In the cases that I've been studying, you know, the Holmesburg prison experiments, because I spoke to three uh, victims of that experiment that were confirmed one hundred percent. And then there was a book uh, written by a guy named Alan Horn Hornbloom called Acres of Skin. And I spoke to Alan as well. And, um, you know, this is a very real thing. But what, according to Hornbloom and all his research, years of research, outside of the many things it was doing that were just atrocious, they were trying to make um, mind-controlled assassins with those drugs. Mm -hmm. And during the experiment phase, during the mind-fracturing phase, those drugs were used. And, um, you know, Timothy Leary may have been a villain in this case, you know? I mean, he's he's trying to dance around and, and, and appear as he was some kind of love guru passing out LSD for everybody. But there, I've seen footage of Leary with MK Ultra scientists drinking cognac by a fireplace and laughing and laughing it up. So- That's annoying. Yeah. Wow, that's disturbing too. Yeah. Um, you know, going into obviously some more of the things that, that I mean, there's so much for us to talk about about what you're you're working on right now. Um, you know, you did such great things uh, with the God helmet and and with that that series, but what's going on right now with you know what I know personally about with Off to the Witch. You know, what is some the new stuff that's coming up with that right now? So, you know, my, my podcast started off as something I really wanted to do. I was inspired, obviously, by like um, Art Bell or Rod Serling's The Zero Hour, which obviously I didn't hear when it was on the radio, but um, mm -hmm. heard later. And, um, you know, Coast to Coast AM in general, the early days. And I always wanted to do something like that. And um, so it's an audible experience only, the podcast. And um but i the new series of documentaries is off to the witch presents so it's it's the continuation of strange world in a lot of ways it's the way i originally pitched it in terms of its style and and i have full control over it so the first two i've shot two so far one is in post-production and um the first one is called a haunting we will go and i took a great broad stroke subject matter of ghosts and hauntings and did something very traditional but also something very new with it and so it's not what you keep seeing over and over again from everybody that approaches this subject which is you know and, and this might upset some people but a, you know a few people in a house running around with devices over and over and over again that light up and beep now i've done this on my own shows but i tried to make the, that episode different um and we might have a couple of those things 
but that's not what this documentary is. It's it's a reverse. It goes back to that nostalgic period where we were talking about in the beginning of this episode, and then everything after that that inspired me to want to look into, but also a celebration of our mortality, our immortality with Halloween. Halloween is a big subject matter in it. Horror films. Why is it that we we celebrate all of these things? You know, I have, I'm, I, I'm surrounded by the supernatural, whether it be in fiction or in magic, you know, um, art, it's, it's music, it's all over the place. And we, we love and we celebrate these things. So um, that's what this is. It's more, obviously it's a factual exploration. I talked to a lot of incredible people that look into the unknown and we go into haunted places, but it's not what you're used to. And hopefully you love it 10 times more than any of these, these things that are being made. Um, and I'll have it out for Halloween. And I've been working on that with the intention to make something of quality and something that changes uh, the genre a little bit. Um, and then the other one is completely different. The other one is about, you know, I grew, I grew up in New York and an alligator eating you was unheard of. But then you move to Florida and there are people walking their dogs and completely get devoured by a prehistoric beast you know, uh, unsuspecting walking near a canal. So that was amazing to me. It reminded me of those creature features I grew up with. And I um, met with a, a biologist named John Bruggen in St. Augustine, Florida. I met with gator hunters, um, spoke with victims of families of people who have been attacked and, and killed by these things. And then people that believe that they're not the vicious monsters that everyone keeps saying. Looking into legends like Two-Toed Tom, it's a full spectrum. And it's once again, the execution is really unique. And I'm trying to give you something fantastic. And so Off to the Witch Presents will be expanded into a, a, an ongoing series of documentaries about the arcane, the unexplained, the paranormal, completely done uh, my way and outside of the network system, yet it'll be available on probably 20 different streaming platforms like Montauk Chronicles is. And um, I am working with a, a, a network on a, a different thing, a, a series of movies right now. I can't say much about it, but uh, at the moment, but it's big, it's a big deal. And um, something that I'm writing and uh, something that I designed, and now it's a big uh, collaboration with a pretty big network. And, um, you know, it's uh, the paranormal shows. I made a couple of them with networks. I don't believe I would return unless I had final cut. As I don't feel like it's worth putting in that time and effort. You know, this isn't, I don't do this to feed my ego. I don't care. You know, I've, I've had my own show on networks twice now and it's not, um, that's not why I'm doing this. I wouldn't want to be caught in that loop. I think it's a perpetual hell to mm -hmm. be there on TV and to sit there and act like you're scared in a house when they scripted the day for you, you know, it's fake. Yeah. And has the desire to do that, I think you need to reevaluate your life because it's going to leave you quite empty at the end of the day. And uh, so everything I make is is quality of quality. And it's something that's meant something to me since I was a kid. Like I sit here with these books. These are the books I literally carried around when I was a kid, not copies of them. These are them. This is from my library when I was a kid. And I have a shelf here with all of those books still and obviously everything I've collected since then. So this means something to me. And, um, you know, as you know, one day you're not going to be here. We're going to go somewhere else. So I want to live well. And uh, for me, it's always quality over quantity. Well, your work, you know, it really resonates, obviously, with a lot of people. It resonates with me and has from the first time, you know, I've ever watched anything of yours. And, you know, Montauk Chronicles is amazing. Um, I, everything that you put out, I always am, am ready to go on it when it pops out. With um, A Haunting We Will Go, you know, I, I want to jump back into, you know, and, and we don't have to touch on the subject, but, you know, you alluded to how, you know, there is this recycling of these these shows today. Right. Why do you think it resonates so much with people? Is it just familiarity? I mean, I don't think it does. I think that the um, the programmers at the networks, it's a combination okay. of things. for them to be economical. Number one, mm -hmm. okay, I, and I know this for sure, economical, 
Um, so they don't want it to be too complicated or too detailed. They don't want it to take too much time. It's really quick and easy to lie going into a location that is said to be haunted, fake the night vision cameras, because that's what they do. Fake that they're scared of something around the corner. Oh my God, did you see that? Oh, did you see that? And I don't want to beat up on these guys too much, but that's exactly what they're doing. And if you don't think they are, then you know, you're know you living in a dream. That's exactly what they do. And so that's what's available to people. But the people outside of that system have no excuse. They should dive into the, this incredible ocean that is their imagination and create something fresh for the audience. The audience used to know and used to love something else. And they're going to love something else soon again. You know, this old way of doing the, it's, it's going to, because the thing is, it's so homogenized. Like everybody's making the same show in that realm. There's nothing that stands out. Everybody's doing the <laughs> same exact thing. And so what you have is a period of time where no one's going to go back to it and whatever's coming next will replace this because people want to go where they are excited, where they're uh, fulfilled, they're inspired. And um, when that thing shows up, the rest of the stuff's going to be left in the dust. And that's just the way it goes. If you look back in history, that's the way it's always been with music, movies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's time because... You know, you have my my biggest complaint about this again, and anyone should first I want to say anyone should be able to do whatever they want and should be able to look at whatever they want to. That's not my business. But when I see some, I know the reasons why it's done, and it's also a lie. Um, and it's it's not worth wasting your time with. And they're not even giving you proper information. And so, and it's not done well, it's not stylistically done well. There's no, there's nothing to really get from it. So I loved those things that late at night I would catch or in the afternoon, and there was a poetry to it. There was a poetry to Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of, and there was an honesty about it too. He was never trying to, there was not one episode where you caught Leonard Nimoy or Robert Stack walking into a place and acting like an idiot, tearing a shirt off and starting to yell like alleged ghosts upstairs to come and yeah. scratch. So if you could find that episode, you show me, but I don't believe it exists. I agree. And, you know, I was really disappointed. And I mentioned this to you recently. And, you know, I'm not trying to specifically call anybody out, but I mean, it's it happened and it's been very public. You know, you had a, a, a show on Discovery or I believe it was Discovery, which you, know, you have ghost hunters who you know, is one of those recycled shows. Right. And uh, you had a, a very fresh take on ghost hunting. Uh, it was destination fear with these young kids that were driving around the country going to real, in my opinion, some of them from what I've learned are some of the most haunted facilities on the planet. Right. And they were doing really well. They were doing something fresh and, and new and they got shut down because they were going, uh, I guess, too good or too well. And and I have a problem with that. And and so I'm very happy to to know that your things are coming our, our way soon. But you know, what is your explanation in, into having that type of event occur in, in TV? You mean shows not being on television? Shut down because they're doing well or maybe doing better than another show on Just it. Just like in anything, there are rivalries and people try to dismantle something because they feel threatened by it. A hundred percent, I it's been confirmed behind the scenes. I know that it happens and has happened. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'm going to say on that. But the good thing is, and I praise everybody who works outside. And again, I got nothing against networks is their business. They can run a business and I'm working with another one right now. So I'm not against studios or networks at all. What I'm against is repetitive, boring, horrible programming that offers us nothing. I speak, I'm speaking as a, as a fan, as someone who loves this stuff that I want more. And so I'm making that instead, you know, I want to make that for us. And, um, you know, hopefully you like it. I think you will. I mean, my my ten year old documentary Montauk Chronicles is not for everyone, but there's a lot of people that love it and and received it the way I made it. Same with the shows; it's not for everybody, but but there are people that love it. And um, 
as ghost adventures go, my my issue with it as a fan, I'm not even talking as a filmmaker, as a as a producer. Let's I'll step out of that for a moment. It's just somebody that watches TV, right? My issue is in all of this time, I happen to know that you didn't do a hundred things that it would have been infinitely more interesting on all of these episodes, wouldn't have cost you that much more money. And I don't understand why they're not doing it. You, we could sit and meditate right now and create an incredible show about ghosts that's unlike A Haunting We Will Go. I'll ask a few questions. What is it, what is the feeling? Have you ever experienced a haunting outside of the, the, the dog? Okay. Yeah. If you if you were to go into let's say some a location that someone claimed was demonically haunted, would you have caution or would you dive in head first with everybody and just play like it was sport? Would would you be cautious about going into this place? I would. Okay. And perhaps why not question all of these people that keep entering these places day after day after day that is supposed to be extremely active and demonically haunted, yet nobody's coming back with anything worthwhile. It's kind of like those Bigfoot shows, like, uh, uh, what is it, Finding Bigfoot? As much as you might enjoy the people on it and they feel like friends, and that's none of my business if you do, Right. in, in 20 seasons, they never found anything. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But I can design an expedition right now while we're talking live in real time that I think would be more effective than 20 seasons of that show. And what I, what I recommend is something that lasts at least a month, that there be a base camp that at that base camp is where guys like us should be. We shouldn't be going out, maybe locally telling stories, interviewing people, um, sharing stories and making sure we were there for the audience and that we communicate with, let's say three or four people maximum that are highly trained, that are hired outside of this realm, that are real trackers, Green Beret types, you know, mm -hmm. real seasoned hunter types, trackers um, that are going to be out there for that entire month. And that for a while, we prepare a certain amount of cameras that would go out to a certain perimeter. But after that, these guys are out there by themselves. Total stealth mode moving throughout that month. And throughout that month, we have on new guests. We have breaks where you play movies, you know, where we can sleep. We have mm -hmm. switch out hosts. It'd be the greatest expedition that's ever been assembled. And that if, if, People who think they're Bigfoot experts have just put their egos in check and sit back and allow and let's let's pick people who are true experts in finding something. You know, that where where Navy SEALs are hired to try and find people, um, people who are understanding that it, if these things are out there, and I do believe they are, um, that they would smell us and feel us coming from miles away, miles Agreed. away hear us so we would keep base camp way back something like this this is this is what i would uh, be interested in i i i'm so happy you said that and i just wanted to throw a audacious amber's comment up because obviously the logging companies do have some things that that they are are trying to control they don't want people to know that these things are out there. Just like you made a point about millions of people out there that have had experiences with just uh, supernatural ghost, the ghost, uh, you know, uh, part over here of the paranormal. You have millions of people, you know, who have had legitimate. Oh, I'm not saying they're not real. I want to make that very clear. No, no, I know. I'm my, just saying my, the TV shows aren't real. <laughs> yes, I agree. And and I just wanted to say, you know, you have people over here who have had all these experiences, but yet they're being quelled and shut up. Because if they were, God forbid, to be found out that they really are real by the general public, what that would do, you know, just finding a bird that is on the, you know, the the uh, the list of maybe going extinct will shut down whole uh, programs there. But I have been waiting for somebody to do exactly what you just said, Chris, for so long. 
so often do I sit back when I'm going through and, and I will change one of those shows after five minutes of just rolling my eyes. Right. How can you go into an area for three days and expect to have these beings that are there that, that you know, I know at least the type that I saw are out there. And the second you walk into those those areas, they know you're there. They're right. watching everything you do. Like you said, they smell you. So you're there for long periods of time. They get used to you. You start to smell like you're surrounding. So awesome for me to hear someone else say that. Because it's, again, just what they're doing is is very, you know, it's, it's so much like what they're doing on Ghost Hunters. It's just yeah. recycled yeah. stupidity. What they're doing... On what you're seeing on those shows is that it, the, everything's pre-structured and written, okay, and their parameters set, and they know what the outcomes are going to be. They know what this guy's going to do in Act One, Act Two, Act Three. They know who they're going to talk to. They do their best not to insult the people that they're talking to because those people have really experienced something, you know, that they they bring on. But everybody in production knows, and the hosts know that they're faking it, and. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate because you don't have to fake it because there are real things out there. And I I had some rules when I started Strange World. Number one, I don't want any of the usual suspects on my show, meaning the people that keep popping up in every single one of these shows or the talking heads, I didn't want them. No offense to those guys, but didn't want them on the show. I didn't want the show to look like every other show. And then I said, I want to do this real as much as we possibly can. When you're making a documentary, a docuseries, you have to stay on schedule, unfortunately. So some things have to be shaped like meaning we're going to do this today. We're going to talk to this person today and our outcome has to be pushed for this. But I know I, I fought with them at every turn. I said, I'm not faking anything. I won't do it. And it frustrated people because they wanted me to, you know, but that's how all of these shows are. And people want to do it because they get to be on TV for some reason. And they like that better than, you know, why not? Let's let's tell good stories. Let's explore the history. If we come across some kind of evidence, well, there's better people to talk to than, you know, some of these goofballs that are running around with no evidence, you know, like they're like Dr. Barry Taff, M Michael Persinger, who's passed away. We were going to speak to him and unfortunately he passed during our development period. Um, but we did get the device and we did speak to one of his colleagues. These are people that were exploring the unknown and doing their best to, to keep a record and find some evidence, replicate the situations. So for instance, in a haunting, we will go. I came up with one of those experiments without being a scientist. And the one experiment I wanted to do that I never really saw before was in a house with a lot of activity. A man did die there. And people have experienced this gentleman in the house. You'll see this in a haunting, we will go. And, the, and a lot of its stories, we do have a traditional seance because I had a uh, Robin wind, a trance medium believe that she can channel the spirit and have it speak through her. So you'll see this in a haunting. We will go. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm observing these things. I'm not shoving it in your face and saying that this is real hundred percent. I'm telling you, this is what I experienced. And these are the people I spoke to. However, I do believe several of them have had experiences in that house. And this gentleman, unfortunately slipped and fell in the bathroom, hit his head. He was alone in the house and he was scared. He was terrified and he died bleeding and, and from his wound in the hallway and expired there in the hallway. So what I did was I got an actor, um, Tom Liu, fantastic guy who was also kind of spiritually receptive to things. And we had him be this gentleman in each of these stages. He was in the bathroom. The actor is emotion. The actor channels a character. Well, he was playing this gentleman. He was feeling him in each of the places he was until he expired. And every time I would bring him into the makeup chair to further the wound, get him close to the place where he would be laying in the exact spot that the gentleman died and interviewing him in each stage. And then I had ghost hunters essentially taking readings of every kind during each of these stages. Because if anything was gonna provoke some kind of spike, and it was, 
And, 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 and I didn't portray every little thing that happened. There were things flying off the walls during this thing, but I didn't want to over sensationalize that. I really wanted to focus on how, how Tom was feeling during that time. So this is all one of the things I did in A Haunting We Will Go. I wanted to try something different, something I'd never saw in one of these shows before. And I got that idea from, um, you know, Richard Matheson was one of the great writers of The Twilight Zone. And he um, wrote many things. He wrote I Am Legend. He wrote some of the greatest Twilight Zone episodes along with Rod Serling. But he also wrote uh, something called uh, Somewhere in Time. And in the movie adaptation, Christopher Reeve where goes into a home that is 300 years old, puts on clothing of the day, lays down in a uh, bed from that time period, and literally transports himself through time, through that method of meditation. Uh, it was an interesting concept. So I wanted to kind of rearrange that concept and see if we can provoke something to come out of, out of the shadows, so to speak. My wife's favorite movie, uh, just to let you know, she just walked by and said, and I know because I watched it with her when we first started dating. So absolutely one of my favorite movies, heart wrenching at the yeah. end, but, um, but amazing. And, and definitely in my opinion, believable that something like that could occur Sure, uh, with all of the strange things that, that happen. Um, looking at, you know, Man, uh, I can't wait to see when this comes out. Well, you know, I don't want you to give anything away, but looking at some of the like specific spots through, just say the the United States. What are some of the places that really jump out to you as you know? Oh, well, that's one I'd really like to go check out. I'm really careful about haunted locations, but the one place I would. <laughs> And, I, and of course, I pick one of the, the heaviest ones, in my opinion, the one that scared me the most. The one that's on sale every other year is uh, 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. The other one is more infamous, Dracula's Castle. I mean, I, I've read stories outside of, obviously, all the folklore there and Black mm -hmm. Epic and everything. They, the castle itself is it's said to have so much activity. I mean, there's some incredible stories, great campfire stories that came out of that place. You know, years, obviously, centuries later, but people say that that place is uh, notoriously haunted. That's the second place. That would be incredible. Uh, I'm, you know, we'll get to the question after. I just wanted to comment. I mean, you look at just Gettysburg, how haunted that place is. I mean, you think about the number of people that died at the hands of, of Vlad's men. Uh, yeah. That has to be incredible. So sure. um, would you mind uh, the, uh, uh, answering Audacious Amber's uh, question here? Of course. Okay. So Persinger, and I, and I believe something very similar is meant for healing. Since I've used it, my dreams have been, my, my dreams are always vivid, but for a three month period after I used the God helmet, I had a, a, a thing where I would just, when I was dozing off, I would immediately be in a dream state. And I had some headaches for a little bit after too, but that's maybe because I had a, a large amount of caffeine that I was told not to have before I went through the sessions. But you know, you're on the road for seven months and you need to stay awake. Mm -hmm. um, so for healing, I guess, of course it could, maybe psychological healing, but they're using a lot of methods now outside of the uh, electromagnetic fields. Um, they're using certain psychedelics now for healing, uh, mm -hmm. for depression. Ketamine? Um, yeah, uh, but I wouldn't, I mean, if, if you contact Todd Murphy, who is a former associate of Michael Persinger, who sells the God Helmet from his website, um, I think you should ask Todd because he is the scientist. He's the designer of the helmet. And I, I do believe he he believes it, it has many healing properties if used correctly. I'm just somebody who experimented with it and had some odd experiences after. And my dreams have been very vivid ever since. They've always been. But now it's like as soon as I fall asleep, I'm in a dream state, a very vivid dream state. And so, when was the last time you used it, Chris? Oh, uh, 2019. Wow, so it's still 
having effect on you. To I think day. it makes an alteration. Yeah. Unless something changed in my physiology that year. Um, but I don't know why I would. Wow. That's incredible. Um, someone, I hear the special delivery 57. Uh, everyone, a God helmet is a device that uses electromagnetic fields to stimulate the brain, specific magnetic fields that are thought to affect the brain's electrical activity, leading to altered states. Is that your... Sure. If you, if you consider what I experienced when I was using it, and you can watch the episode uh, in one of those links, you can see the actual, what I went through during the experiment. Um, but since then, yeah. You know, I would call it quite an altered state, what I was experiencing through the the moments of using it. And there was a pre-session that was off camera that I had to go through the night before I was in a, a hotel. Well, maybe it was two nights before the hotel room in Los Angeles. I spent the whole night using it by Todd Murphy's uh, instruction. So did you physically see anything with your 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 vision? change or was it more just in a way yeah I, I it was more audible though i was hearing things that weren't there and that's interesting because the whispering that i heard when i was 14 maybe there was a strong electromagnetic charge the only question i have against that is why did i hear it the second night at my parents house and again you could say oh you know were you on something no i wasn't and the other part was um you know, if it was some kind of odd thing happening in my brain, why like clockwork just two nights in a row, not during the day, not at any other time and never again after and never again before. Wow. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. that it? Uh, Poncho Zorz, Poncho Zorz uh, has been commenting since you had said, you know, if we put together an expedition, we might have to do one. He's curious about where would you you know, like to do it if you really were to put one together. There's a really, so I had made a recommendation to Dave Spinks. So get in contact because it would be a great for all of us to get together on it. And, and I think, you know, the meeting of the minds, we all sit, we talk about what it needs and then we make it happen because this is something that all of the, the audience would love to see happen. And we we're very honest about what the resources we need for it. Um, the people we're hiring, let's really be honest about that. Cause I know, you know, no, this is no offense to anybody. There are experts in, in Bigfoot history and there are experts in, and I went on expeditions myself, the next uh, episode of my little web series that when I get around to finishing it, uh, will show my expedition in Michigan, Utah, Colorado. And I'm not a Bigfoot expert, but I've followed people that have been exploring these things for a long time and some great stories and great perspectives, but, and one experience one night also that is, is very curious that happened, but I believe a month with the right people and though, and, and we stand back, we're the orchestrators of this wonderful thing. We're the mediators of it. Let's be honest about who the experts are in terms of tracking, who can be out there in the wilderness for a month. Let's get schedules down. Let's be the people to make this happen. And also to protect whatever's out there too, because we don't want, we have to come up with a plan on how to protect what's out there. Because as soon as we call out the area where we saw or capture an image of this in an honest image of it, everyone's going to be running there because, you know, people want to shoot one and we don't right. want to be, I don't want to be the person that made that happen. Me either. No. Uh, you know, they've got the people, you know, until there's a body on the table, science is not going yeah. to ever. I don't believe that. I believe there's going to be other ways of proving these uh, things. Of course. You know, I don't think you need to kill one of these creatures to do that. And, and I agree with you, um, man. The, you know, there's something that we'll talk about after the show uh, that that I'm thinking about doing, uh, not think about, I'm, I'm setting something up that I wanted to run and just at least get your opinion on. Of course. Uh, bringing the right people together, doing something, going somewhere and not recycling, you know, uh, same old types of things. You have all the uh, freedom in the world. That's the thing. We, we're outside of that. There's no reason to uh, regulate yourself and try and be a brand X version of what's being done on television. This is a way you, I don't, I don't, I don't, it's not a competition, but this is a way you can beat them because you have the freedom to create 
as far as your imagination can go and get coupled with people that can uh, technically make these things with you and make something happen. And it's just an honest meeting of the minds and not to go off the rails too. bring science into the mix. I mean, you know, you had science, Grover Krantz said what you just said before he died. He felt that if I find one, I want to shoot it. I'm going to kill it. I don't agree with that. You know, these, these things uh, are elusive for a reason. They want nothing to do with us. Uh, Poncho Zorch, write me on Planet 412's uh, email. It's uh, it's on the 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 uh, front of my website or my uh, YouTube channel. Please, uh, I'd like to speak with you. Uh, so write with me, Chris. I wanted to ask you. Uh, somebody had mentioned a little farther back when we were speaking about something else about you know the missing 411. What are your thoughts on what's going on there? Now I know that's a big you know, uh, questions to tackle. Mm -hmm. But what, what are some of your, your beliefs on what it's well, on? I have the book right over here. But so, and I talked about this on my show not too long ago on, and, and really went through details and reports, okay? And there is enough evidence to support first that there there's a lot of odd things that happen that are, you know, you can't even explain. And I did a missing episode for Strange World. The network wanted me to focus because we, it was in Mount Shasta. So the network wanted me to focus on the idea of Lemuria. But I really did speak to family members of the missing. I did speak to search and rescue. I spoke to law enforcement. And there are things they just can't explain. Well, there was in the summer of 2019 was a woman in California who with her husband and her dog went into a park, national park. Her husband's parking the camper. She's walking out with her dog. And she walks a little further, I guess, down towards a stream. And there is a man. Okay, this is the middle of nowhere. Comes out of the woods with a knife. This is right out of one of the horror films we grew up watching. She runs. She takes the dog with her and she runs. Okay, five days she's missing. She's missing for five days. And they are sending out search and rescue. They're doing everything they can. Finally, she shows up after five days. Oh and she explains there was this strange man that came out of the woods with a knife and he chased me. And that, I think, in a lot of cases, is what's happening in Missing 411. People are showing up, corpses are showing up with their pants on backwards, with their shoes taken off. And so in that episode of... Um, off to the Witch, I talk about a movie that was made in the late 70s called Rituals with Hal Holbrook. And it was about five doctors. It was kind of like a deliverance riff. Five doctors, they go on this trip in the middle of nowhere. And one of the things that happened the next morning is that their boots are taken. And that was made way back. Now, if you wanted to immobilize somebody who's camping, take their shoes remove their shoes from the camp, playing a game with them. And I think the same thing is happening. If you watch Rituals, you can watch it on Tubi or some of the free sites right now. Watch Rituals is a great example of maybe what these people that we we hear about that go up missing after they're on their camping trip um, may have gone through. Something stalking them. Someone is stalking them. And I think there are a lot of reclusive mountain men out there. I think there are, and in the advent of something like Instagram, where you have a lot of young people showing off and saying, look at me in this national park. I mean, there are like 20 something year old girls in these parks yep. doing live streams. Like I'm by myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, this is a catalog for really sick people to come and find you now. They know where you are. They know you're by yourself. And they're inspired for, to look further into this because this is a common thing now that people go and do and that they're out there by themselves. This is no joke. The, wil the wilderness is no joke. You really have to know what you're doing. And I, so I brought up somebody who did, okay? A guy named Richard Prenicky, uh, Dick Prenicky. He, uh, in his 50s, strong as an ox, goes into the Alaskan wilderness and is there pretty much a good deal of his life. And National Geographic... You know, he Prenicky shot 
some footage, 16 millimeter film footage of himself in the early years. The guy knew how to um, build things. He built his own tools. He built his own refrigerator in the ground. Like he was a really smart guy and he was capable and he knew how to hunt and knew how to take care of himself. And that's what he wanted to do. He built his own cabin. He shows up and he knocks down trees and builds his own cabin. It's called Alone in the Wilderness. I love it. It's a very comforting documentary. You can find it on YouTube now. I saw it years ago. But Prenike was the greatest example of somebody that can go into the wilderness and not become a victim to anything. Animals, the elements, some guy with a knife. You know, I'm sure he was prepped for any of it. Guy in his 50s, stronger than any of us, you know. And, um, you know, he stayed there until he was 80 and then he finally, you know, moved back home. But not everybody is like him. And, and, and you're vulnerable no matter how much you think you know this place will, the wilderness will swallow you up. And I think that's why so many people go missing. They're not truly prepared for what they're entering. Now, what about, uh, and I agree with you, there are human predators out there doing, now what about the, the high strangeness? No, what about, you know, like the, the, and the missing 411, the hunted, when the when the hunting crew went out and the older gentleman disappeared, his hunting partner uh, said he heard something that sounded like a, a metal trap going off in the middle of the woods, had no place right. being where right. they were. And this older gentleman just disappeared. What do you think about those cases? Like certainly right. exist. And those are the ones I was I was looking into more odd cases for Strange World, people seeing stra odd lights in the distance and. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, doppelgangers. And the one that really inspired me to, to look into it was before I even read uh, David Politis's book, his first book, Missing 411. And there's, it's a variety, you know, it, it's not just mountain men possibilities. There are other things. There is high strangeness. There are mm -hmm. things you can't explain. And this was one of them. This was a gentleman in, um, it was over a dinner during the development period for Strange World, I was out in Austin, Texas with the co-production company. And I'm sitting with one of my co-producers and we're having dinner at this restaurant. And we're talking about, you know, all of the episodes I presented. I presented 30. We made eight for the first season. So one of them he suggested, and it was this. He said, look, I know a famous newscaster. She has a story that she's sitting on. This just happened. And it's later came out, this story, but gentleman in Idaho with a film crew. He was working in the sound crew, I think. And this is at the end of their shoot. They're out there in the woods. And this is a normal guy. It's like if you and I went out with a bunch of people and we were shooting a documentary and um, our buddy who knows us this whole time, who's as normal as normal can be, we're standing next to him. We're talking. We're maybe getting ready to shoot something. And you look to your right, and he is running at full speed into the woods, never to be seen again. That's creepy stuff. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. But that happened, and they never found him. They never found a body. And that, to me, was very intriguing. So that's not a mountain man. And the, and the, also, that's very similar. Um, to the the one, I think it was a Dutch boy or somebody in the airport that just ran out of the airport. Have you ever seen that before? I don't know all the specifics. Uh, a young man went on a vacation by himself, I think somewhere in South America or, or, or elsewhere and was in the airport getting ready to take off. And all of a sudden he just ran. They showed him on the security footage, jump over a fence, run across the the uh, runway and into the woods, just like that. And no one has ever seen the, the young man again. Yeah, uh, that's an odd, odd situation. Um, I saw that question about what books. I would say, if you're not familiar with this book, When Roger Met Patty, this is a very thick, painstaking analysis of the Patterson-Gimlin film by William Munns, who is a Hollywood special effects artist who worked on a variety of things. He worked on uh, West Craven's Swamp Thing. He worked on Return of the Living Dead. And this is just one of the greatest books, I think, that anyone could ever write analyzing that film. And Munns 
believes that Patty is real. That that's that's real footage. So I, I agree. Pick this up. It's a fantastic book. I will definitely. I have. I know who he is. I've seen him interviewed actually about uh, uh, Patty, and I that will be one I will be grabbing. Mm -hmm. Since we're on that subject, I mean, my I I've talked about it before. I 100% think anybody that is doubting that you're watching a real Bigfoot walking across that creek. Your your feelings on that that film. I agree with Munz. I agree that you can see muscle structure, the way it moves. You know, it, this this guy has an eye for it because he builds those suits for a living. And there's no suit, even I guess even putting like padding that's weighted down or or some kind of gelatin that might, you know, uh, simulate the way heavy muscles move when something gigantic is walking. I don't know. He said even now, you know, what was it? Um, Rick Baker, they asked too. He's like, I can't, I, I can't replicate something like that. You know, we can create the illusion of it, but I can't replicate it in real time. Right, CGI, they could do it, but I mean, yeah. she had a, she had a uh, on, on the one on her quadriceps, she had a a, a muscle that was, uh, oh, I forget the the name, uh, uh, it, it was hemorrhaging or something. It was all swollen, and you could even right. see you yeah, had the ball on the on the quad. So, uh, yeah, anyone that, oh, that's somebody in a monkey suit, they will, that thing, that's from the future then. Because right. That was incredible. Yeah, great ghost story. And they, this is out of print, but you can find it if you want to shell out maybe 30 to 40 bucks for it. Great ghost story. Um, and this is about a, a Hamlet subdivision that was built in 19, starting to be built in 79, 1980. So this is a haunting that took place between 1980 and 87. And it was an old slave cemetery. And in vulgar disregard, um, the developers just said, I don't care, and built houses over it. They didn't even move the headstones. They didn't even take the monument and, and honor it. They just built the houses over it, knocked everything down, threw it out. And that was the Black Hope Cemetery. And followed by that, people were seeing apparitions, grotesque, you know, corpse, rotten corpses walking through their hallways, whispering at night, bad dreams, bad feelings. They would walk into those places. And then people were getting sick. Cancer. Uh, a 30-year-old woman dropped dead after her mother her life was falling apart and her mother was trying to honor these people and, and please, you know, like she was putting their rings back in the ground and they found, you know, somebody was digging out a rose garden or whatever, and they found all this stuff. And so she kept the jewelry or whatever she found, the trinkets. And she was, please, I'm sorry, apologizing. You know, the, the homeowners were naive to this. They didn't know any, any different. It was the land developers that committed the crime. But what is it about, you know, desecrated ground that all these people were being punished. And I wonder what's really what's happening there now, uh, so many years later. But good story, really good story. Thank you. You know, touching on uh, cemeteries and, and like uh, Indian burial mounds, you hear a lot of uh, experiences of people seeing specifically what I saw, a dog man, that, that frequent or Sasquatch, that frequent cemeteries or, or burial mounds. Have you heard any of that before? In terms of um, Sasquatch that burial mounds? Seen by them, that they are frequently seen or, or hanging around by them. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Joe Stewart in person, and he's the one that took me on this expedition in, in northern Michigan, in Mayo, Michigan. And he took me to a place called the Field of Screams. And he was showing me things that he believed were created or left behind by Sasquatch. He had an encounter when he was a kid in the 60s. His, his, him and his dad were hunting. And you can hear uh, Joe, you should get him on the show, but uh, on the live streams. But I interviewed him a couple of times, or once for Off to the Witch. So there's a great interview with Joe about everything about how he feels about what you just talked about. Um, do I believe? I believe for them to have been able to do this all this time, either they are protected 100% and concealed, like many things have been by the regulators of our society. Uh, 
or they're very intelligent. They know how to, they, they communicate with each other somehow because it seems like all these populations in different states and locations around the world keep their breeding population down or that might be something inherent in their intelligence realizing that there's no way they're going to fit in with us so think about what they've witnessed they witnessed you know the the um, genocide of the native american indian they witnessed the conquering of the united states the revolutionary war um the civil war you know, like all this violence, this industry pumping black smoke into the air, us bringing all this stuff here. And they want nothing to do with us. Yeah. Wouldn't you if you were them? Because they knew they weren't going to fit in. They must be intelligent. You know, they must be. Because we would see more of them, don't you think? I, I agree. I, I think they are actively hiding from us. I, I believe some of them, you know, because then you get into the whole concept of you know that there's a separation between uh people that believe in in these cryptids if you want to call them that or not uh, of the of the high strangeness or the woo that you hear mm -hmm. or just all natural now from what i saw with my own eyes with my three friends there was woo going on there was of course things supernatural that occurred multiple times when we saw when we were watching this being come after us and when it left that steel mill building um you know i think that they're they're able to either open portals or cloak themselves i know they can cloak themselves because i saw its arm cloak at one point but uh, you know what are your thoughts on do you, do you believe that there are these underground sy uh, systems and cave systems that they're utilizing because there's got to be places where they they are living and I they're mean, not being seen. Yeah. I, we don't have the answers to our existence and there have been odd things uh that have been seen since the dawn of time that we try to put an explanation to but can't i mean the apparition that i saw was it a ghost i don't know what i saw I saw it though. I know I saw that woman walk down the hallway and walk into my office and not be there when I went in there. And I don't, I'm not prone to hallucinations. So um, there, I, there's you know people that I trust and someone I love very much who had seen something when she was a, a little girl. Uh, you know, I I saw things. I mean, we all saw things and there are people around the world that have seen things. So who's to say where they're coming from? I think existence, does it walk through a portal? I, you know, it, we could call it that, right? We could call it a portal, but is there a parallel existence? You know, um, in literature, one of the many people that wrote about it was H.P. Lovecraft, his short story called From Beyond that was later expanded into a, a movie. And the idea was, much like Michael Persinger, there was something called, you know, like, well, it was called the, the resonator. It was in, in the movie. And and that would create a field where the barrier, right, the, um, the um, psychic barrier between us and whatever is surrounding us breaks. And we can see each other now, which doesn't work out so well in that story. Um because maybe we're not supposed to see each other and, and, and experience each other. So there could be an entirely, or many of them, parallel universes occurring at the same time. And quantum physics, which is science, is starting to understand this idea. It's starting to prove that. So yes, of course, I believe it on that level that I think many things exist. I don't know where... Um, you know, like I believe in imagination because I can sit here and come up with a million stories tonight. Um, but it's like, you know, somebody came up with this creature, okay? But somewhere out there, you know, maybe there's something like this that does exist in the Amazon. And, you know, this, she sculpted and created this creature for Universal Pictures. And they told her that what they wanted, they wanted a gill man. And she came up with this thing. And, you know, I mean, that's how it's done. But what is imagination? What are we channeling? Are we channeling something that exists? You know, is fiction just a, an amalgam of, of things we're channeling from elsewhere? I don't know. And, and you know, it's interesting how you had brought up, you know, uh, sometimes we are being able to see these things. When I went and I was having so much trouble dealing with my dogman experience, I, as I told you, 
Uh, I went and I, I sought out priests of my church for some counsel because I just didn't know how to deal with what was going, what had happened. And, you know, I'll always remember his, his statement. And he said, you know, Matthew, and he believed me. And he said, um, sometimes there are those things that bleed into our realm. Sometimes we come into the same uh, existence, so to speak, as these other beings. We're not always meant to see each other, mm -hmm. but sometimes we enter the space at the same time. Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes nothing does. Uh, but, you know, he, he was a firm believer in that there is a veil that's over our, our eyes here on Earth that hides things that, you know, that could be walking through, you know, my room. I believe that there are things right now walking by us. You know, are we two ghosts or, or to these beings that uh, stand in the corner of rooms, these shadow people, are we their ghosts? Are they seeing us and saying, oh, wow, who's that? What is that? What's right. that right? And that concept so, has been portrayed in fiction, like in, in that motion picture, The Others with Nicole Kidman, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and many ghost stories, um, and I'm writing, I'm writing a few things right now, but one of the things I'm writing is, is a ghost story, unlike anything I've ever seen, but it's about perspective and I love it. I love diving into this world with these characters that kind of retain their humor and their personality into this other realm. Uh, you know, this, this, this purgatory where they're still seeing live people. And even enjoying the idea of kind of teasing them and scaring them, you know? <laughs> well, you hear, and I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to read that. But, you know, I remember hearing an experience on Skinwalker Ranch where they were talking about hearing voices out of nowhere talking about, you know, something like two people just having a conversation. And then they spoke up. And the the two voices stopped for a second and kind of giggled at each other and and told them to be quiet or something and went back into their conversation. So that's yeah. kind of similar to what you're saying. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there was a gentleman that um, I, uh, you know, in that in the Strange World episode, Demon Time, he um, was plagued by these things that were uh, invading his world at night. And he had a recording that, you know, sometimes people have these these recordings that I'm like, okay, whatever. But it was enhanced and it just sent a chill down my spine listening to it because they were discussing about what he was doing and like laughing and he's awake. And it wasn't him that recorded this, you know, like sometimes when someone's trying to hoax something, it's like you can hear the guy you just talked to, the inflection in his voice, but... Mm -hmm. You know, this was weird. It struck me like the experiences struck me that I had, or you know, you know the difference. It's like, no, this is this is actually it's really different. Yeah, yeah. It's something different. It's amazing. And and um, you know, what knowing what you know, Chris, I mean, has it affected the way that that you go about your daily life at all? I mean, I know it's had to have affected what you've done in your career and, and the direction you've taken. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a very metaphysical perspective, so everything I'm writing has that in it for the most part. The fiction that I'm writing has this kind of metaphysical journey because I know I'm not going to be in this body forever, mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. I don't want to go anytime soon, right. I, but I want, to in, I want to really enjoy this visit here and learn as much as I can before I go uh, and say what I've learned, you know, through my work, express it. It's part of the journey, you know? So that's, so for me, yeah, my perspective changes, I guess, with every experience. That's why I could never be in some perpetual loop for 10, 15 seasons, lying to the audience just for a paycheck. And having you know? nothing to show for it. No, uh, that's going to be thrown down the memory hole. Right, when it's right, over. it's a joke. And you will know, get discarded too, by the way. You know, if you submit to that stuff with some group of people that's just trying to bank on a few seasons with you, you're, you're going to be thrown away like mm -hmm. garbage. So don't ever do that. You have this wonderful opportunity now to, well, I'm holding someone else's book. Um, you can self-publish now. You can 
you can create, but learn, see the, the, now that all the tools are in your hand and the ability to reach the world is in your hand, quality should be your goal with everything, everything. Like I, you know, I love your, your show. It's fantastic. Thank and, you. you know, Thank it, you. it's about quality, the introduction, your interaction with the audience. It's all welcoming. It's all, let's exchange these ideas. Let's, I love how this show works, you know? Thank um, you. Yeah. That's, that's our, when you're putting on a show and when you're interacting with an audience, it should all be about, you know, mutual respect, quality, entertain them too, you know, like that's what we're here to do. Now, but you're doing, we don't have to lie. We have great stories to tell. You're right. You're right. And I, I am, you know, uh, enthralled with what you've done, you know, and you and I've had a conversation about this and, you know, I've said it to, to my, my, uh, my extended family, I don't ever say fans or subscribers because they're my family. You know, I don't, I don't blow smoke. I don't, I don't brown nose. If I throw a uh, compliment your way, it's coming from a real spot. And what you're doing is incredible. And it's inspired me to, to better myself. You know, everybody that's in the chat right now, I wanted to real quick, um, please, if you have any questions for Chris, put it in caps. Um, you know, uh, ask him whatever you would like. Uh, and in the meantime, I wanted to ask you, Chris, for, for anybody like me or for somebody that's, uh, you know, starting to do what you have gotten to such a huge mountaintop in, in your career after working so, so hard to get there. You know, I know how hard you've worked. What would you say if somebody said, you know, how would you go about if you're just starting to try and be successful at doing what you're doing. In terms of movie making and making yeah, television? Starting. I would say realize, number one, you have, this is such a wonderful time to, that never really occurred before because you can create, your education is free. You know, like I went to film school way back but you can learn because there's so many incredible tutorials. There are master classes being taught by Martin Scorsese, David Lynch, Werner Herzog, Spike Lee, Ron Howard, uh, Oliver Stone. I mean, like they're, they're, it's across the board of the greatest living filmmakers. And you could take all their master classes with one simple fee for a year, plus all these great writing courses. Wow. I would say avoid any traps. Like, I don't know how it's done but I hear that people are writing with AI, don't do it. No, 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 don't no, no. do it. I've made a few thumbnails for a weekly podcast with AI, but I don't take credit for it. I'm saying I'm the director. I'm the one writing all this stuff for that thumbnail because it's neat and, and I like it. But I've given the AI artist even a name at times because I've made a few library tracks, you know, music tracks with it. Like I, I had a real composer do the theme song for Off to the Witch, but some library tracks are done by AI, and I made up an AI composer's name is Enzo Omerda. He, he does the music. I'm just the director. I work with him the same way I work with a regular composer. I give him ideas. I tell him in the style I want it, but I'm going to give him credit. So if you're going to use AI for anything, give the AI creature a name and some credit. Um, outside of that, learn. It's part of life's journey. It, however you're going to display it, if you're going to write, wow, you get to publish your book now and promote it to the world. And, and the best thing you should do is just write a great book. If that's your passion, read other books, read other really good books, read, read literature, um, you know, just, and take some of those writing courses if you haven't. And if you're already a good writer, then pour your heart out and take your time and make the best thing you can possibly make. Because while you're taking two or three years to write your awesome book, some other idiots hitting a button to write it with AI, but no one's ever going to care about that stuff. Mm -hmm. This will be forever. I mean, or at least until we're we're gone off the planet or whatever. Someone's mm -hmm. going to want to read this. You know, Black Hope Horror came out, uh, and th this came out in um, ninety nine. No, this came out in eighty nine, eighty nine or ninety. So I'm holding it right now, talking about it in twenty twenty four. That's where you want your book to be, not to be thrown in a pile later on where everyone says. Yeah, this was written with AI. We're not interested. Agreed. I agree. Thank you. Uh, no one is asking how many young boys were kidnapped for Montauk Project. So it sounds like an extreme amount 
But if you look through missing records from 1970 to 1980, uh, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Um, and and that's on the, the records of the missing. People have gone missing in, the, in that number through that time period. So what Al Bielik said, I'm not saying I'm saying it, but what Al Bielik said, it was in those numbers, you know, many, many, many thousands of boys over uh, over a decade of time. If that matches kids that have been go- missing and, you know, disappeared into the ether during that time period, I don't know for sure because the Montauk project hasn't been 100% proven. But the Holmesburg prison experiments were proven. Mm-hmm. And you can look into that through uh, Alan, Hornbro- Alan Hornbloom's uh, research on acres of skin. Awesome. Uh, Poncho, and thank you, Chris, for that. Uh, Poncho is saying he needed this. It was inspiring to hear. Uh, thank you for that comment. Yeah, go uh, look into the, um, what was it, K- Kindle Direct Publishing. Right uh, on Amazon, and and you can publish your book now uh, in physical form and have it I distributed and sold. Yeah, so yeah. so that's glorious. That wasn't that wasn't available. People had to go through gatekeepers. I I think we we missed out in in the last half century of very talented people who didn't get to complete their work because of these gatekeepers. Like a few people stopped. Brilliant minds. Do you think the filmmakers, the writers, the musicians of all those days were the only ones? Mm-hmm. Come on, you know, probability will tell you otherwise. That there were there were so many talented people out there that never had their shot. Give yourself the shot. That's my advice. Give yourself the shot, but respect yourself enough to get to the point now where you have something to give to the world, and that is all in your hands. So romance that journey. I promise. I practice what I preach. I take. I, it's about time for me. I'm a chess player. I will spend the right amount of time. And when I strike, it's going to count every time. And it's about quality over quantity. Could you real quick, just give everybody in it. Cause I know you and I have had hours long conversation, which I will hold on to forever. Could you let everybody know that's here real quick about how hard it and how long it took you to get to where you are right now? I mean, it was gradual. Um, you know, uh, I was a little kid with big dreams. I, I I had a big imagination. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I think there was an instinct for it there. And then, um, you know, I, I some years later, I go to film school and really cared about it and learned as much as I could. But even coming out of film school, at that time, you didn't have practice time. I, there was no practice with 16 millimeter film. It was so expensive. So all my knowledge was theoretical walking out of film school until two years later after graduation, I get my hands on this video camera called the DVX 100 shot in 24 frames per second, like a movie. And I just kept using it right away. I went out and I shot a scrappy little documentary with it, but that got distribution. It, it got like video of the month in Fangoria magazine, George Romero, the, my favorite filmmaker saw it, really liked it, invited me up to, Canada to hang out with them on the set of Diary of the Dead. So that happened early on. And then, um, but it didn't make a, a lot of money. It made a little bit, but not a lot. And I, I couldn't do it for a living at that moment. But one thing I told myself is that no matter what job I was doing, and I worked a variety of jobs, um, I was always a movie maker. That you have to, like a lot of your heroes, right? Romance, whatever you have to do. Don't you? That's you. You're you're this person. You're still writing. You're still creating. You're still speaking to the world. It's not about fame and for the fortune is you're doing this thing. You're accomplishing these goals. That's the true fortune. But eventually, uh, after working on the Montauk Chronicles thing for nearly ten years, I remade the movie. Uh, it started to catch the attention of uh, networks like History Channel, and this was gradual over like a two year period, and then. Um, you know, they wanted to make some kind of sequel to it, which ended up being the Dark Files. It was a financed investigation. They, during the process of development, they asked me to host it also, which I was just an executive producer at that time and directing the recreations. And then I ended up hosting it. And then that ended up uh, catching the attention of Discovery Travel. And then they said they wanted to make a series with me. And they had an idea in place that was similar to Montauk, uh, you know, to, to the Dark Files. I said, Give me two months. Let me put something together. I want to show you what I want to do. I presented Strange World 
and it was greenlit. You know, in between, I did Ancient Aliens because of the stuff I did before that. You know, and then um, the pandemic hit. I had two new shows greenlit at that time. We're talking two years of the industry being destroyed. But during that time, I shot two documentaries, uh, rewrote my screenplay for South Texas, created the podcast. And uh, I'm just running through really quick what I did. <laughs> and then uh, now I'm here, you know, and, and we have a new network project happening. But it's not a my investigative shows will be made independently. But once again, this is the time of self-publishing. This is the time to do it. I, I'm telling you that I could go get a network investigative show right now. And I won't do it. It's much more interesting and fulfilling for me to make these independently. You can also, by the way, now distribute your hard media, your physical media for, for free. You don't have to invest in the product anymore on kunaki.com. Any documentary you make, you can publish like they do with the Amazon book program. And you just make a percentage. And they don't own your movie. So mm. for you the video distribution stuff and you can self distribute on all platforms through several different film hub variations and, and get a decent price. I make good money off of Montauk every month to this day. So it's, it's really how far your imagine imagination can go, how far you can prepare yourself for these things. And that's what I'm saying. Like now that you have, you don't have to go through gatekeepers anymore. Forget them. They don't exist. We killed them. So now you have it in your hands. It's not going to go away. Now just prepare yourself uh, to the best of your ability. I love it. Uh, Punch and thank you. And, and for me, you know, uh, that that is so important that, you know, listening to what you've gone through and how you had people telling you that they wanted to change this or that, you being able to do it the way that you want it is, I mean, you get to lay on your deathbed someday and say, I did it my way. So that's. That's a beautiful thing. Keep doing it. Yeah. I did. And, and, you know, the, I don't know. I'm just letting, I don't know. It's not going to be easy. I just want to say. That. Of course. Yeah. Well, you worked hard and you deserve it. Uh, yeah. Poncho is asking again, could, could you use AI to pre write and make it yours? I mean, I think legally gonna... you can, you know, you're not going to be punished for it but i the journey of writing is really important to me like it took me this many years to kind of get good at writing that i'm not mm -hmm. about to mess it up with ai but if you i don't really know how to write with ai i've never tried it yeah. but you know it, it if you feel like that's going to help you and you can still get your your inner voice out through that method you know i i'm not knocking it wholeheartedly there are some things i think in ai as movie makers uh like, let's say I wanted to make a big, epic sci-fi film. There was no way I could afford it before. However, if you get really creative with AI, for instance, if I had one of my Cinecams right here, and here's a dolly shot, and here's a microphone, and I'm moving towards the mic like this. So with AI now, I can tell AI, turn that microphone into a skyscraper, turn the sky into like a burning sky, which is, you know, night, like Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. And... It's going to instead, why don't we create the models for the best we can for a city and create the composition? And then here comes the, the shot. Now, that shot in reality would cost hundreds of thousands. But with AI now, I can just make it with creativity. I would do that because I wouldn't be able to afford the VFX artists that could do that for hundreds of thousands. But I can make that shot and many like it with all of my own creativity. I'm still the director and composer of the shot but I'm going to give credit to the actual flame artist or whatever they call them. The AI artist is going to get a credit in my film, you know, just as I would credit a normal human being, right. but I'm not at that stage at the moment. So, and the technology, how good it's going to get and how much AI is going to change, which, and of course we could get in the conversation of yeah. the negatives with AI. Yeah. The more, the more interactive you are with it, the more respect I have for that. Cause I'm okay with that. I, it's like, Use it as a tool, but don't just hit a button and say, oh, here's my book. You know, like, what's it worth? Well, that is it's phenomenal. Thank you so much, Christopher. We did, before we go, if anybody has any more questions, please, in caps, write it. Um, Chris, would you like to let everyone know, you know, anything else that is, uh, you know, coming up for you and, and uh, any other information you'd like to drop? 
Sure. Yeah. A haunting we will go is it, so special to me. I think you're going to love it. Um, I talked a little bit about it during this conversation. It will be ready for Halloween for sure. And I'm on a steady schedule with that. And right now I'm working on a big network mini series uh, that I am writing and executive producing and um, a co-executive producing. And uh, I'm so excited. I can't really tell you what it is, but it's, it's uh, based on a true story. That's the best I can say. Well, we can't wait. Uh, it has been an honor to have you uh, as my guest. I've been uh, looking forward to it. And uh, I appreciate everything that you uh, told us and dropped. And I look forward to working with you again in the future. Um, I hope that you'll wait in the green room for me as I, I say goodbye to everybody. Everybody, please say goodbye to, to Christopher and, and let him know how much you appreciate it. I do again. Thanks, Chris. Man. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Everybody, uh, thank you to Christopher Garitano. I, the man is is uh, just a, a wealth of information and what he has achieved. Uh, you know, I've spent hours on the phone, luckily, with him. And he has worked his tail off to get where he is. You know, you hear stories of people that just have worked and worked and worked and finally are starting to get fruits of their labors. That's where uh, Chris Garitano is. Christopher is is one of the good ones. And the things that are coming up, uh, you guys are really going to get a, a great uh, view of it and are really going to enjoy everything he's doing. I want to thank uh, my wife, Stacy and uh, JC for, uh, and I think I saw Andrew maybe in here a little bit for, for modding for me tonight. I want to thank everybody for showing up. I appreciate every one of you guys know I love every one of you. Uh, you're my extended family. Um, just to let you know, uh, on top of, uh, please hit that like button, subscribe. I found out uh, on top of all of the the uh, the views and stuff, there's a lot of people that watch the videos that don't subscribe. I could really use your help. If you could subscribe, I'd appreciate that. Um, we have Patreon now. If you want to join that, I'd really uh, I'd love to have some of you over there um, trying to get some new equipment. I would really appreciate, you know, if you guys could help make Planet 412 something very special. Uh, you know, there is a point that I want to get this channel to where it stands heads and above anything else. And that's for my mind, not in competition with anybody something that I have in my mind, a dream, if you will, that I want to see Planet 412 achieve. And that will give you guys the best product that you could have. And if you could help me achieve that, there's a, a link to an Amazon um, wish list that just has some things on there for new equipment that will help me achieve that so that you enjoy uh, the channel more. And that's what I want to give you guys. So thank you very much for being here tonight. I hope you guys have a great week. Uh, I love every one of you guys. Thanks again. Thanks so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe as it greatly helps out the channel. I'll see you next time on Planet 412.